Welcome to another episode of Talking Watches. And with me today, we have a, a longtime friend of mine and a guest coming to us all the way from Kuwait, Jasmine, aka Patek Holic on Instagram, kind of an Instagram legend, if you will. How you doing, man? Good, good. How are you doing, Ben? It's been a long time. I've, I've missed you, I've missed New York. But this, this, this has to do until we meet again. Absolutely. So if, if you could tell a little bit uh, about kind of your history, how you ended up being a collector in the first place, and of course, maybe even a little bit about your, your life and, and where you are. Like you mentioned, I, I come, live, lived all my life in Kuwait, a small country in the Middle East. I currently work as a stockbroker. As a young man, I was really in love with watches for some reason that I couldn't articulate. At the age, I think, of 16 or 15 after bugging my mom and dad for a watch. My mom bought me a Tag Heuer that she brought back from one of her vacations. And uh, that was my pride and joy for my high school years. At the end of my high school years, I bought my first watch, which was an Omega Seamaster chronograph. And then the journey started from there. After, after I finished uh, university, uh, I worked, started earning some money, but exclusively only Rolex. I think I had reached 28 Rolexes in my collection of subs and GMTs, and I was learning as I was buying. And then I met a person, an older gentleman, who became my mentor for trading in the markets. One day, he looked at my wrist and he said, uh, oh, you like watches? And I said, I do. And he said, I do too, but I only buy Patek. And so I had, I had heard about Patek, but I have never held one or never walked into a store and seen one in person. So in 2007, or I think to the, towards the end of 2007, I saw a 5712 rose on a brown strap, completely in love. Price was five times uh, the, you know, the, any Rolex I have ever bought. So I went back home, sold 28 Rolexes, and yeah. bought my first Patek Philippe, which was a 5712 rose, and then the obsession, the fuel started. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's it's important to kind of re remind people exactly, you know, kind of who you are, and I'll, I'll get get it going, and then you can kind of take it from there, but you are at Patekaholic on, on Instagram, I would say arguably, not even arguably, like definitely the most influential Patek account on Instagram. How did you kind of get the idea for the Patekaholic account, and how did that begin? I remember I was in the Hilton Hotel in Kuwait. A friend of mine called and he said, uh, Hey, Jasim, I want to ask you uh, about a watch. I want to buy a watch, a Patek Philippe, and I need your advice. And uh, I gave him whatever advice that I had at the time. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thankful for, for you know, the time you've given me. And you're the guy I go to because you're Patekaholic. And I like the name. It had a nice ring. And from the beginning of, of, of day one to this day, it's a hobby. There was no goals out of running Patekaholic. And I think this is why people like it. This is why, because it's, it's pure in its nature. I make, sometimes I make mistakes and sometimes yeah. I'm very harsh with my words and sometimes I'm unpolitical, but it's an account from the people, by the people, for the people, if you will. And so, you know, after you bought the 5712, where did you go on from there into, into the world of, of Patek and kind of what are some of the watches that, that mean the most to you? So in 2008, towards the end of 2008, I get a call from the agent in Kuwait and they say, we have a watch that we think that you should see and we think you should buy. So I obviously get in my car, I go to the agent and they show me this 5070P, which I obviously have to change the straps because I have very large wrists and this is something yeah. <laughs> the entire world has heard me nag about. But yeah, I looked at the watch and I was in love with the watch, but I was at the phase of a 5712 and a 5960. So I was about in the 20K to 30K range at the time. Those were the prices. This was priced at, I think, 79,000 or something like that. So I call up my mentor and I say, I was just presented with an amazing watch. I am totally in love. The size of this case is gorgeous. The movement, I've never seen a movement like this ever in my life. And I have spent probably half an hour just staring at the movement. And I really want to buy it, but I cannot justify paying the price. And he tells me, if you don't buy the watch, I'm going to come there and force you to buy the watch. So I was scared and I actually bought mentor, the watch. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, I thank him to this day for making me buy this watch. It's a controversial reference, for, especially for the old school uh, Patek collector, because of the case size and because of the movement size. And so not a, not a lot of people agree that this is the best move. But for someone like me, for you know, a person with a very large wrist, having large wrists, uh, for me, someone who not only likes to buy watches, but I like to wear watches. And so this has prevented me for many years being able to buy vintage, for instance. I cannot wear a 33 or a 35. Even a 36 can, can look a bit, a bit small. But after buying this watch, I started a, an obsession, and I bought a rose gold version, a white version, and a yellow gold version. I had promised myself that I would work very hard and save up for many years in order to buy a 5071. And a few years later, I got a call from someone we both know and informed me that he has one for sale. And I made, at the time, the biggest purchase of my watch collection. And I had a problem bringing it back home to Kuwait because of shipping services, insurance, and all that stuff. So I had the watch shipped from California to New York, and it sat with a friend of mine. And the day I had it delivered, and I had it in my hands, is the first day I met Ben Clymer. I had lunch with you <laughs> so and, John, yeah. and John. <laughs> I had lunch with you and John. I, I think you remember that day. I sure but, do. But um, a very special watch for me. So what are some of the other watches you, you have with us today? So um, in uh, 2015, in Geneva, summer Geneva auction season, in a Sotheby's auction, the world woke up to find out that Patek made a 5167 steel with a green or a camel green dial. And I happened to be at the Mandarin Oriental when that auction was going on. And it happened to coincide with another big auction. I think it was maybe a Phillips or a Christie's, I'm not sure. But basically the room at Sotheby's wasn't filled. So I was excited thinking that maybe I can buy this thing. As I was bidding on it, I saw Marlon de Simone kind of walk up to me. He's like, oh, you're gonna buy this watch? And I said, I think I will. And I saw him bidding on it. So obviously there was a battle and then some other people jumped in and the watch was sold, I think for 50 or $60. But uh, ever since that 5167, people started to order a strap that was made for the 5167 camo and install it on 5167s with a black dial. And so these became so impossible to buy that in today's market, it'll cost you $10,000 to buy an original Patek Philippe uncut camo green strap. So when Patek announced the 5168, I called up Kelly, who was our friend from Tiffany X mm -hmm. back in the day, and I said, Kelly, listen, I know the list is probably a mile deep, but I'm calling you two minutes after they announced it, and I have to buy this watch. And so this is the first Tiffany stamped 5168 with a camel green dial. That's great. I came to find out that Patex made lighters. And the, you know, being a cigar smoker for many, many, many years, I had this dream in my head that I'd be sitting somewhere in Italy after a nice meal, and I'd light up my cigar with a Patek lighter. I got this from two of our mutual friends as a birthday gift and I love it dearly. A few weeks later, this showed up, another lighter, also from a friend with a original certificate, which I hear are very hard to come by. Uh, to have for a lighter. For a lighter. So this is a very special gift that I cherish and hold dearly to my heart. John Reardon today released a video, which I've been begging him to release to teach me how to fill these lighters with gas. And he, <laughs> mentioned, <laughs> and he mentioned that Patek had made 200 lighters total. total. So I'm proud Amazing. to tell you that I own 1% of that market today. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> it's not bad. Moving on to this 5990, which is pretty much beaten up. In my opinion, it's just a great, uh, a great tool to have on your wrist. So I was in New York picking up a 5524 
travel time from Tiffany or Patek Philippe Tiffany. As we were wrapping up the sale, I asked, is there any way I can buy another watch? Because it's gonna take me 17 hours to fly back home. It's not like it's easy to come to New York. Problem was, is I was wearing one on my wrists, a non-Tiffany dial one. So I walk out of Tiffany to the Diamond District. Mm -hmm. I take off my watch. I sell it. I get paid in cash in little like Chinese food, black plastic bags. And I'm walking down <laughs> the street with $50,000. And I go to Tiffany and I put the money on the table. I'm like, I'm going to buy the watch now. <laughs> so it, it was a little disaster trying to ensure that this has happened. But this has come with a cool story and something Definitely. that I really, really love. This is my, I know you. this is your world. This is my late grandfather's watch. It's uh, from the 1950s. It's a date just that was serviced only one time in its, in its lifetime, in 1960, in Geneva. Wow. But it is a testament to what is Rolex. This watch still works. The hands still hack, the dates still turn, but... That's kind of the beauty of Rolex, isn't it? That's exactly. That is the beauty of Rolex, and this is why I, for the past three years now, I have started to amass a nice little Rolex collection again. You can't go wrong with, with a Rolex. I'm sure you get the same question asked over and over again. What should I buy and what should be my first watch? And even though, you know, I'm Pataholic, Jasim, I always say your first watch should be a Rolex to this day. There's a reason yep. why. There's, uh, there's just mm -hmm. a reason why these watches are great. So what is, you know, now that you've got a, a really nice collection of, of Pateks and other things, what is the grail for you? You know, what's the one that, you know, if you had all the money in the world or all the access in the world or you knew where it was, what, what would you buy? I had befriended someone who still, uh, still, I still consider him a friend. But that someone told me that a 5070 in steel with a black dial, dagger hands and a bracelet, detachable, exists. Mm -hmm. He also told me that this watch belongs to him. And he told me that he has the watch with him where he resides. So knowing that I have a deep love for 5070, I basically convinced him to sell me the watch. The money was unreasonable, let's say, but <laughs> Extreme, yeah. given the circumstance, I was willing to make it happen. So I flew from Kuwait to London and then to Geneva to meet my friend so I can buy the 5070. I was supposed to be delivered that watch in my hand in Geneva. And my friend never showed up. Wow. To this day, I do not know whether that watch exists or not. So if Ter Stern is actually watching this, can you please let me know if Patek yeah. has made one or not? But hey, this has shoot you a DM, right? <laughs> yes. But yes, this is this is the watch that has. Uh, I don't know whether it's real, but if it is, it would be it.